Arizona is truthfully off the charts when it comes to overrepresentation of certain populations in our prison. Um, but it is not because certain populations are committing more crime. It is because of policing issues. It is because of inherent bias. It is because of prosecution policies. And then the question becomes, what do we actually do about it? From the very moment a defendant is involved in this system, someone else has control over their story. They want to define that person solely by the crime they may have committed. You have a sentencing date set and the stakes are high. Both lawyer and client need to do everything in their power to prepare. But the question is, are you ready? I'm Doug Passon. I'm a 25-year defense lawyer, a sentencing consultant, and an award-winning documentary filmmaker. In Set for Sentencing, I'm going across disciplines and outside the box to help both lawyer and client expand their perspective, build on their skills, and get real results in the form of significantly reduced sentences. All of this in service to one goal, to bring more fairness, more compassion, and more justice to the sentencing process. So, are you ready? Then let's get set for sentencing. Hey everybody, this is Doug Passon coming to you from Studio 3553 in Scottsdale, Arizona, helping us get set for sentencing today. A very special guest. Yeah, I guess I always say the guest is special, but I think today is actually special because it's a little different than than what we've done so far today is julie gunnigal who is the democratic candidate for the office of the maricopa county attorney and i'm going to start out by saying yes i am going to tell you dear listeners now and later that if you're so inclined to help julie uh in her campaign that uh you can visit her website which is gunnigal22.com, and it's going to be right on the front page there, a donate button. And you should also know that, it, listen, anybody who's heard the podcast, it's not going to be a big mystery where my politics lie, so I'm not going to pretend that I'm a totally neutral party in this situation. But truthfully, I do believe in equal time. And and if if your opponent um, was here, I'd plug her website too. And, and I'd, and I'd tell people to donate to her campaign. And I actually did invite Rachel Mitchell, your, um, Republican opponent to be on the podcast, not like together. So I didn't, you know, for a debate, but, um, haven't heard back from her. So maybe she'll be here. Maybe she won't, but today it's you, it's all you. And we're going to talk mostly about, um, your platform, as it pertains mostly to sentencing, because this is a sentencing podcast, but we may get to other places. But why Why is this? Why are we doing this? So, you know, Maricopa County, this is where I live. This is where I started my career as a baby public defender at the Maricopa County Public Defender's Office. Um, this is my home. And, and for better or for worse, it's where I learned started learning how to to be a lawyer so it's it means something to me but i think it should mean something to people that even don't live in this in maricopa county or in arizona because people may not understand this but we're a big place we're the fourth largest county in the nation and maricopa county is quite often on the national radar uh for criminal justice issues and often for things that maybe reflect not so well on, on our county and the way that we administer justice here. So in a lot of ways, people look to us and what's happening here, and and so goes the nation. We've had Joe Arpaio. We've had a string of Republican county attorneys who have been leading that office as long as I've been a lawyer, and that's over 25 years. And they seem to have just gone from bad to worse over the years. And you are um, you got real close last time around and you're a Democratic contender and you are uh, coming in with a lot of great ideas. So we're going to dig right into them. But first, let me throw it to you, because we always love stories on this podcast and more specifically, we love origin stories. So tell me yours um, in general, but then obviously, why why, why did you choose to? to put yourself out there and make this run. Sure. And first of all, thank you so much for having me. 
So for everybody listening, I'm Julie Gunnigal. I was born and raised here in Sunny Slope, and I got my start um, after going to the University of Notre Dame Law School uh, doing prosecution work. I worked in a small county in Northwest Indiana, and then I developed an expertise in financial crime and public corruption. In fact, I worked for the professor who wrote the RICO statute, and that's what got me interested. And eventually, uh, it's the reason why I became a prosecutor in Cook County, prosecuting public officials when they were stealing public funds. So you can imagine my surprise moving back to uh, Phoenix, the place that I call home after 10 years that I could raise my kids here, and just seeing the difference in what my home state and my home city had become, watching how we were prioritizing this money going into our private prisons and not into our public schools, watching how we were doubling and tripling down on a tough on crime mentality that does not make us any safer. And then watching our continued adherence to the kind of philosophy that Joe Arpaio and Andrew Thomas espoused um, inside our county attorney office, I said, well, we, we can't do this anymore. So I ran in 2020. We came closer than any reform-minded candidate has in 40 years. It's been 40 years of Republican county attorneys and ultimately missed it by 1%. So I continued my work in the community. I work for the Arizona Poor People's Campaign, where we focus on housing justice, keeping uh, landlords who are unethical in check. I also worked for Arizona Normal, helping expunge thousands of cannabis convictions And when this office became so embroiled in scandal that our county attorney had to step down and a special election was called, I threw my name into the the ring and we did the impossible thing, right? Everyone said that nobody can get those 4,300 signatures that you need to run in the 13 days that we had to do it. And we said, hold my beer. And we did it in 21 hours, the fastest that any county candidate has. So uh, I guess it's a long-winded way of saying like we're running an exciting campaign. I hope to be a breath of fresh air into this office. This is the third largest prosecutor's office in the country. We could be leaders. Instead, we've been one of the most regressive states in the union. That needs to change. And you and people don't who don't live here when you say names like Andrew Thomas and they that doesn't really resonate with them. So Andrew Thomas was um he he was disbarred for uh, ethics violations, allegedly, and, and well, not allegedly for ethics, but he was disbarred. There's no allegedly if you're disbarred. Right. And um, corruption, um, um, abuse of power, going after judges and things like that. So that was swell. Um, I grew up in the era of Rick Romley. And then after Andrew Thomas was Bill Montgomery. And, you know, it, that, too, is an interesting history because, you know, he um, had bar allegations leveled against him for failure to properly supervise mm, Juan Martinez um, and and other issues there. So, you know, he 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 I don't think he ever had to answer to those because after the bar complaint was filed, he was, uh, I guess, rewarded with a Supreme Court position. So the, the point is not to dredge up the old news, but there is a long history here and you're coming you know when you win if you win you're coming into an office with a culture of a really checkered history and you know that culture is deep and and wide and especially when reformers come in to play who have ideas about what's wrong with the system and how to fix it there's a lot of pushback because this is the way it's been done this is the way we do it and this is our culture um, so you would have a monumental task ahead of you to sh- take this ship and turn it and and change the culture within the office. How are you going to do that? Yeah, and it's not going to happen overnight. So um, there's a few different things. First, we know that this office has had a historic exodus of talented attorneys in the last several years, and that's because of these failures of leadership. Uh, My opponent has been in that office for 30 years and has never voiced any objection to the likes of Andrew Thomas and what Bill Montgomery was doing and is very much just promoting that status quo of culture. So here's what we can do to change it as rapidly as possible. First, we know that we need to bring a new perspective to prosecution and empower our prosecutors to actually do justice. That means equipping them with the discretion that they deserve, both in charging and in sentencing. 
And when we do that, and when we train our new attorneys that this is how justice will be done in Maricopa County, it is going to ease so many of these recruiting problems. One of the issues that I've taken to heart, and I've spent a lot of time over at ASU's campus talking to these attorneys, I mean, I got into prosecution to do justice and because I wanted to do trial work. At the county attorney level right now, neither of those things are happening. So there is an opportunity to recruit talented young attorneys. The other thing I can tell you, having run this race before, is how many seasoned attorneys have left the county attorney's office during the the reign of Rick Romley or Bill Montgomery because they weren't respected, because they were overworked, because they did not enjoy the culture there. And they want to return to finish their career at the county attorney's office. So the the talent is out there. The people who are able to be change makers on the ground exist in Arizona. They just need to know that the leadership of this office will promote them, will support them, and will not get them embroiled in the kinds of bar complaints that we've seen flying every which way because of the conduct of this office. You know, when when you talk about uh, the flight of talent. I think about, I haven't practiced in the county for some time, and I, I don't know to what extent this is still the case, but the bane of my existence there was the policy book. And what it did was these lawyers t- took all of the discretion away from the individual line attorney to do the right thing in a case by offering a plea agreement that was you know maybe fit the person rather than the crime you know the 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 and it was what is the charge how many priors this is the plea offer period and if a lawyer wanted to deviate from that they would have to jump through uh, hoops go to the supervisor and nobody no new lawyer wants to put their neck out and it was always you know sorry but this is the policy and i'm only following orders and um I hate that because I believe in my heart of hearts, you don't punish the crime. You have to punish the person who committed the crime and you have to look at individual factors and mitigation and you have to have the ability to exercise discretion in a case. And that is completely taken away from these lawyers Um, to the extent that that is still happening there. What's your take on plea policy and discretion for line lawyers? I mean, that is still happening there. Literally this afternoon, our county attorney announced another plea policy that takes discretion away from the line attorneys and creates mandatory prison time for certain classes of offenses. And I think everybody sees right through it. It wasn't evidence-based. It's not going to keep our communities any safer. Um, But what it does do is it hurts the morale of the office because you're right. We need attorneys who are willing to do justice and that means engaging their critical thinking skills. It means looking at the whole person. It means doing what's right and not merely what the maximum extent of the law allows. And if we get attorneys in there who are more committed to protecting the community and doing justice than they are at merely getting convictions, that's how we can right the wrongs that we've seen here in our county. Because to this day, we remain the fifth largest incarcerator in the country and the eighth largest in the world. If Arizona, just to to clarify that, if Arizona was a country, we would be the eighth largest incarcerator. We spilled $1.5 billion every year into this system that fails half the time and we see recidivism. So we need, right? Would you, would you invest in a, in a company whose product fails 50% of the time? Would you keep throwing money at it? I'm surprised it's only 50. I, I thought it was more like 80 or something, but no, of course not. And, and, it's so okay so how okay so there's so much there that to chew on but let's just talk about over incarceration then because a lot of those folks maybe could have been diverted from a prison sentence to begin with some all, some kind of alternative what 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 are our options there and how do we change that there's at least three incredibly well proven david data driven approaches that we can take um one is that i am a big fan of specialty courts In particular, all throughout Maricopa County, we have these municipal level veterans treatment courts that are a great example. A vet comes in who's justice involved, uh, and it is 
true wraparound services. They're connected to mental health. They're connected to uh, food security. They're connected to housing if that is an issue for them. And because of the federally mandated services that we provide veterans who have served our country, it is largely at zero cost to the taxpayer. Those courts see the lowest recidivism rates in the country, yet we have not made it available at a pre-adjudication felony level in our county. So we can take these models that we know are working on the municipal level and take them into county and that will that will serve the public good. And that also includes issues like our homelessness court and our mental health court. Those models can be expanded and built upon. And so I'm just also- give give the listeners a, 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 a maybe a, an example cuz I don't think the the names do justice to what actually happens in the, the courtroom and in throughout the process of them moving through the system and how a mental health court or a veterans court or a drug court is different from court. All right, let me see if I can do this without crying because the last <laughs> time I was in a municipal justice court, a uh, municipal um, veterans treatment court, I watched somebody graduate and I watched mm. how much skin in the game the judge had, uh, the defense attorney, the the prosecutor, all of the um, resources that were that were brought together in this room. So what the models look like, and it can vary based on you know what kind of crime someone is accused of and whether or not you're in a veterans court versus any other court. But it's constant check-ins and accountability. So if, for example, the veteran gets involved with, I don't know, say a DUI, and it becomes apparent that there's an addiction issue, but maybe there's a mental health issue that go, goes in there with it. And once they're connected to those services, there are check-ins with the court. And then once there's the completion of all of these, these different programs, there's a graduation ceremony where basically the entire court applauds the fact that someone has turned their life around, that has made change for the better, and that won't get involved with the uh, justice system again. And that really matters because, well, first of all, it gives me goosebumps just talking about watching people, cheering on people, changing their lives. That never happens in a felony courtroom, ever. Mm -hmm. Um, But watching everybody be committed to ending recidivism and ending the cycle of incarceration. And I think those, those models are powerful. And so these are essentially diversion from a sentencing perspective. If they successfully complete the court, that means no conviction, no felony conviction on their record. Is that right? That's exactly what a felony pre-adjudication contemplates, right? So it's not that there's like a conviction dangling over somebody's somebody's head anymore. And I mean, how, how powerful is that? Especially for veterans, because we live in a county that is the second highest concentration in the country of vets. And um, we have, we incarcerate vets at a rate that we have two prison yards that are just for vets inside Mm. the Arizona Department of Corrections. That's shameful. It's so shameful when you think about the idea of of treating the person more than the offense because these are young people who we who go off to war you know we we train them to be warriors we put them in the most traumatic violent horrific uh, situations possible and then they have things like alcohol issues or substance abuse issues to cope with the trauma and they inevitably find themselves in the wrong end of the justice system and then all of a sudden we're talking about punishment when the whole reason they're there in the first place isn't because they're horrible people. It's because they're amazing people who said, I'm going to give my whole life and sacrifice to you and your country. And the very thought that we wouldn't instinctively go to the place of how do we give back to them and make sure we're not going to burden them with a felony conviction and throw them in prison. um, It almost just seems like, so basic and elementary but of course that's not how the system works so i love i love it so we got okay so we got veterans courts i know drug courts are a thing because they were a thing from way back i actually saw some of those graduations and cried a little bit too um so okay i love that so so those and those work i mean the data says those those things work and they were okay so wow we're focused on data-driven uh processes that's refreshing okay how about this overcharging and can i just tell you a story i know i've got you for a limited time and i don't want to make this about me but i had a case when i was a baby defender it was right after columbine 
when everybody was like, holy moly, we were really scared about kids and guns. It was a 16 year old boy who was being bullied and beaten on by the neighborhood boys. And they followed him home and they were across the street from his house. And he went inside and he got an unloaded antique shotgun, came out in the front yard and he pointed that at him and he said, who's the pussy now? And he went back inside the house and that was it. Boys went home, told their mom, and you, this is an example of overcharging. So what do we got? We got three kids, which means three felonies for aggravated assault. It means three dangerous mandatory minimum allegations because it involves a weapon. And it means three allegations of dangerous crimes against children, which means they're all mandatory consecutive sentences. So this six, and it means charging a 16 year old boy as an adult because aggravated assault is one way we can transfer juveniles to adults. Rick Romley, in that day and age, prosecuted a 16-year-old boy who was facing a mandatory 30-year prison sentence. And then the plea policy. Let's flip to the plea policy. And the line prosecutor, who I'm sure didn't want to make this offer, said, we're going to offer you 10 years in prison for a child. Meanwhile, he sat in the Maricopa County Jail for six months before we finally resolved it. And I was, you know, it was probation. I was trying to get him back into juvenile court, but they wouldn't even do that. But the point is charging, overcharging, mandatory minimums, this this idea that you can you can set the course for the sentencing right at the outset by the way that you charge cases. And there's so much power that a prosecutor has to wield those mandatory minimums and those enhancements. What are we going to do about that? Yeah, we've got three things that we can do about that. Um, first, we can be vocal advocates against mandatory minimum sentencing. We know it doesn't work. We know it doesn't affect the rate of crime. And we know that it places the prosecutor as the most powerful person in the criminal legal system, not the judges who are able to impartially consider the arguments of, of both sides. Yeah. Um, When it comes to the policies in the office, the current policy is to charge every aggravator, every enhancement that's available. Like that is what's written down. Meanwhile, in the protester cases, we see a prosecutor actually being sanctioned for charging every enhancement that she thought was um, was available. And I that that situation just strikes me as just so fundamentally absurd. So. What the new policy should be is that when prosecutors are charging the cases, they are not charging to the absolute max. They are using their discretion to not add those sorts of enhancements. And that the goal is that the the absolute max sentence under what has been charged, that they prosecutors will not be asking for what they will only be asking for less than that. Similarly, what we will be doing at every single sentencing, and this has been one of those data-driven approaches to lower the rate of incarceration and some of these more absurd sentences, is we are going to be telling the taxpayer how much money they will be spending for every sentence that is suggested in court. Oh, interesting. Interesting. I like that. Yeah. I mean, it matters. So if you're telling me 10 years, uh, you know, back of the napkin math, that's a quarter million dollars we would have been investing into that 16-year-old. Wow. Quarter million into a system that's not going to make him any safer. His brain still won't be developed even when he exits prison. Yeah. That should be that should be shocking. Well, how about turning the policy book on its head and say presumption against alleging any of the mandatory minimums, but if you really think, line prosecutor, that this is a really bad dude and really needs to, you know, have the hammer dropped, then you need to go to your supervisor and get permission to do uh-huh. that. You know? <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe. No, I mean, I, I like that idea. What the what I want to get away from, and I think what I actually poorly articulated earlier is the system where you know you add up these enhancements, and all of a sudden you're looking at a hundred years, and for a case that doesn't even deserve close to that, yeah. nevertheless, that's hanging over someone's head. And I think that's the other piece of it that we need to talk about, which is the trial tax and our early disposition courts and how they lead to some of these injustices. We have a conveyor belt of justice that before people get all of the discovery that they need to adequately defend a case, they're offered a plea and they're told that any subsequent plea deal will be substantially harsher. I mean, that's what's written Mm -hmm. in writing. Right. So, And the practical effect is the lawyer who's defending them who might want to take some time to develop mitigation, to investigate the case, to present defenses. If they fall asleep at the wheel and don't quickly take this crappy plea that's offered, 
then they're basically prevented from doing their job. And then the other aspect is what people need to understand is this idea of coercive plea bargaining in the sense that it may be a really weak case. In fact, you may not be guilty. But if you don't just roll over and take a deal, you might you may want to go to trial. That's your right. But if you do, you're going to prison for 30 years. So what are you going to do? Right. So, OK. Can well, you think of another right in the Constitution that you can be punished for exercising? Yeah. And and in the rights trial is supposed to be the sacred right. And how, what percentage of cases actually ever go to trial in Maricopa County? I know in the federal court, it's it's like maybe 7%, like 93%, 94% plead guilty. So there's a reason for that. In county, the la- at last check, it was 3% of the cases proceed to trial. Ooh, yeah. And, and that's not because 97% of these folks are guilty beyond question or have no defense. It's because of these mandatory policies, these plea policies. Oh, boy. Okay. Um. So we talked about overcharging. We talked about mandatory discretion, diversion, reentry, um, expunging pot convictions. That's a priority, right? That's a huge priority. You know, Arizona voters by a 60-40 margin redu- uh, took away our age-old felony restriction on cannabis possession. We were the last state in the country to have everything from residue to two pounds be labeled a class six felony. And so many people were caught up in the cycle mm-hmm of of felonization and not able to get get jobs get housing get student loans because of an age-old pot conviction all 15 county attorneys and your ag have the ability to make this universal and automatic not a single county attorney in arizona has done that so that is one of my commitments to the public is that we are will finally clear out at somewhere between a hundred thousand and a quarter million Maricopa County or originating arrests, adjudications, and convictions. Nice. Why do you think nobody's got nobody's done it? It's easy. It's work. No, no, actually that I will push back on you with that. It is not easy. It's not so easy. Our Unlike other states, so for example, um, Illinois, uh, California, when they went down this path of of, uh, responsible adult use, they made it so there can be a blanket expungement. And in Mm -hmm. Arizona, what 207 said was, no, it can't be a blanket order from the courts. They have to be individually filed petitions, combined with the fact that, as I said, everything from residue to two pounds was considered the class six, but only personal possession less than two and a half ounces is considered expungible. So there's a lot to sort through. And frankly, it's going to be work. It's Mm. never been a priority. But if we want to be committed to real prosperity and to ending the cycle of crime and violence, we've got to be concerned about these very old, very unjust convictions. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit. um, And we're going to talk about something that's going to that's that's a little tricky topic, and it is systemic racism, racial bias that's baked in the cake in, in our criminal justice system. We know that's going to be a hot button for your detractors, and um, I just did a had a phenomenal discussion with the dean of the Detroit Mercy School of Law. This is her area of expertise, and we did a really deep dive. So I'm going to say go to the show notes because I. If you if you if you're someone who doesn't understand what we mean by um, systemic racism, please just listen to that, because the common mis I guess, misperception, but I also feel like it's that it's um, disinformation more than misinformation in a sense that when we talk about systemic bias, that we're putting a finger in the face of this judge or that judge or this prosecutor and that prosecutor and saying you're racist, you know, and, and I don't think that's what we're talking about when we talk about systemic biases. And I I just want to get your take on what, because it's on your website. It's a big part of your platform. So tell me what your, tell me what your thoughts are on this subject. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. That's not the way that racism gets into our criminal legal system. But first at the outset, it is absolutely undeniable that we have racially disparate outcomes in Maricopa County. 
just the sheer number of folks that we imprison. Black people in Maricopa County are 350 times more likely to be in prison than their white counterparts. And that is because uh, and, and that is because of the systemic issue. Um, it's similarly true that Latino folks are about 200 percent overrepresented as a population in out of Maricopa County and into prisons. Why do you attribute that to a systemic issue? A, 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 a person may look at that and just say, well, those statistics just show that those those populations are commit more crimes. And that's the explanation. It has nothing to do with racism. So what do you say to that? I said that intellectually lazy and they should do better. <laughs> okay. Uh, what literally every major study of the criminal legal system, and this is true in, in every single state, we see these sorts of systemic issues and biases, although Arizona is truthfully off the charts when it comes to overrepresentation of certain populations in our prison. Um, but it is not because certain populations are committing more crime. It is because of policing issues. It is because of inherent bias. It is because of prosecution policies. And then the question becomes, what do we actually do about it? If we've seen this in every jurisdiction and nobody has gotten it right, it's going to take more than a well-intentioned white lady to, to end systemic racism inside our criminal legal system. There have been instances where people have gotten it more, more right than others. And the model that I want to bring to Maricopa County uh, is comes from the Vera Institute for Justice. What it looks at is a full audit of how these cases are arriving in the criminal legal system and how they're disposed of by prosecutors. So, for example, one uh, jurisdiction that went through this process found that the reason why Black defendants were facing much higher sentences for the exact same drug-related crimes as their white counterparts is that prosecutors were tacking on a paraphernalia charge to all of, uh, all of those convictions where they weren't doing it for white folks in their area. And once you're able to determine, like, this is, this is the mechanism that we see these, um, you know, injustices operating under, then you're able to make a policy. Well, if you're charging someone with possession, why are you tacking on a paraphernalia uh, charge that first of all that has very little to do with public safety it has very little mm -hmm. to do with the gravity of the offense and if it's someone who's addicted it's it's truthfully irrelevant and that prosecutor's office made the decision to stop tacking on paraphernalia charges across the board and was able to end some of those racial disparities well let me push back on that because in my experience in the county when we had drug cases that weren't pot cases they were dangerous drugs or narcotic drugs so meth coke uh, the prosecutors would tack on a paraphernalia charge, but in the interest of being able to offer a lesser plea, a plea to a lesser charge, because para those were class four felonies and paraphernalia was class six felonies. And then you have the class six on designate. So they were actually arguably tacking on a paraphernalia charge to get a better outcome for the def defendant on a plea. So I, I'm having a hard time understanding where the racism comes and and also doesn't it suggest that if they're deliberately tacking on an extra charge for a minority population that they actually are racist? Like, what's the policy behind that? And those, you know, in the studies there. Well, this is just what was the explanation for one racial disparity in one jurisdiction, because okay. the answer in Maricopa County is yeah. we don't know. We have not gotten into the black box of, of prosecution and how these decisions are made. I can yeah. tell you, having been in a prosecutor's office, that as I'm charging offenses, I have never once looked at someone's race. Nevertheless, if we're continuing to see these sorts of trends, yeah. um, we don't necessarily need to attribute it to someone's intent if we know what the impact and the outcome is. Right. Incidentally, we'll see the same thing if we took a, take a good look at victims as well. So we know that there are a lot of victim crimes in Maricopa County that that aren't pursued. And when we start to unbox, well, who is it that we're not listening to? You're going to find the same trends that you've seen in nearly every other jurisdiction. If it is a black woman who's complaining of domestic violence at the hands of a white boyfriend, he is far less likely to be tried than a white woman making those same uh, uh, those same complaints. So it's it's when we do that sort of intentional reflection, we dig deep into the data, we make the data publicly available, which, by the way, no prosecutor's office in the country provides disaggregated data as to who is coming into the criminal legal system and then what sorts of pleas are being offered, you know, after charging and what the end result is. Yeah. Um, once we're intentional about that, 
we can make policy because we know that we have these outcomes. We know that they're racially disparate, but the how of it requires some real deep digging. And this is, I think this is another big issue here because you talk about who comes into the system. And when we talk about racial disparity, what we're really talking about in a, in a major way in that context is who's the target of enforcement by police. So I, I would encourage my listeners to say, OK, if you say oh, these statistics prove that these populations are more inclined to commit crime, ask yourself, have I ever committed a felony? Because I'm pretty sure that of 90 plus percent of anyone listening to this podcast has committed felonies in their life. Because if you smoked a joint in Maricopa County more than a year ago and you didn't have a medical marijuana card, you committed a classics felony. So the the issue isn't who's committing crimes. It's who's getting who's on the radar of law enforcement. I live in Scottsdale. I don't see police that often and nobody's patrolling the streets looking, you know, for people to arrest. Right. So the so so you've got your work cut out for you in terms of that issue, because you as the county attorney are in direct relation to our Phoenix police, our, our Maricopa County police. And and so <laughs> I don't envy you in that position, but how do you systemically shift the culture in terms of how policing is accomplished in, in, to to minimize systemic bias? Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, that that is truthfully going to be the, the real project, because the spirit of Joe Arpaio still looms large in lots of our law enforcement offices. And we just mm -hmm. saw this last week when I believe that it was uh, Sheriff Penzone was held in contempt um, on this exact issue. So what do we do? Um, once I didn't even hear about Penzone, but for people who don't know, I'm sure you've heard of Sheriff Joe, but his claim to fame was posses rounding up people that looked like they might be here illegally. I stress looked like they might be here illegally and 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 huge civil, you know, federal intervention and then held in contempt and facing jail time and pardoned by the last guy in office. So racism was alive and well under Sheriff Joe. You're saying Penzone is, is doing the same stuff? We're saying that the outcomes of traffic stops at the hands of the sheriff's department, um, and especially stopping black and brown drivers, has not changed mm. and is now in violation of the court order and consent decree. Mm, I did not know that. Okay, yep. so you got your work cut out for you. How are you going to handle that? Well, I think we can do uh, we can cover part of that because the way the prosecutor should be interacting with law enforcement is to be that voice of independence. Right. Gone are the times where the police union uh, picks the prosecutor and and the prosecutor answers to them. We need to be independently reviewing every single case. We need to be looking for this bias. Um, and when we audit the, the results, we'll be able to make those policies about non charging in particular. Uh, because that's one of the keys to get these stops stopped, knowing that they're not going to result in any sort of action from the, the county attorney, um, not just because it's unfair, but also because of public safety, to be clear. Um, the other thing that the county attorney can do is historically the county attorney has not held law enforcement accountable when there have been issues of misconduct, whether it be having a comprehensive Brady list. We actually had to have a local journalist compile a forward facing Brady list because the county attorney's office was so insufficient in providing that information. Oftentimes, defense attorneys were reporting that they heard about Brady. That is exculpatory evidence that has to be disclosed to the defense. They were hearing about Brady information from the news media before they were hearing it from the prosecutor's office, who has the constitutional responsibility of turning over that information to the defense. And usually the yeah. FYI for people who don't know the jargon, ex you said exculpatory, which is great, but it's usually my understanding is a Brady list from the county attorney is basically police who are on that list who have been um, lie found, have committed misconduct or lied under oath or something that would discredit the evidence in the case. You know, is that that's what we're talking about right here, that's right? exactly what we're talking about. And in the past, it was maybe those lists were not necessarily complete or certain misconduct would not come to light and we wouldn't know if we had a lying cop or a, a so a cop who's committed significant misconduct so you're saying 
we're going to make sure that that list is right. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and actually the, one of the biggest issues was just interdepartmental transfers, right? That someone would commit misconduct in one jurisdiction and get hired in another and it wouldn't, it wouldn't follow. And that's information that people are entitled to. So mm. pretty list, no call list for, for officers whose misconduct gets to the level where they shouldn't ever be trusted under oath. And then I think we also need an independent unit for police use of force cases. That is an issue here in Arizona. It's one of the reasons why the DOJ is here because of use of force issues. And it's unfair to ask prosecutors who work day in and day out with officers to prove up their, their regular charges to turn around and hold officers accountable when there is an alleged act of misconduct. And mm -hmm. to that end, we should have a true independent unit so that people know that they're free of that conflict of interest. Yeah. So um, I know that I'm running out of time with you. Um, I, I do want to talk about the abortion issue. And this has probably little to do with sentencing, although presumably someone could be charged with a crime and sentenced for abortion. But this is really a centerpiece of your campaign. And first of all, thank you, uh, because that it's important and it's brave to basically say um I'm not going to enforce you. You have the great slogan. What is it? Not ever. Not, not now, not ever. You got not it. Not now, not ever, which means nobody's getting prosecuted for exercising their right to bodily autonomy. And no doctor is going to be prosecuted for doing their job and following their oath. Right. So that that's big. And um your opponent, I feel like, has sort of danced around the issue, um, but you're right out front and center. But what what your opponent and by the way, I got to say on the diversity and Rachel, if you come on the show, I'm going to be fair with you. I'm going to be kind with you. But I looked at your website and you got a neat video on your website on your homepage. Um, well done. Hats off because I'm a filmmaker. So, you know, cool. Well, it was filled with white faces. And and then I went to your page of who's endorsing you. And there's seven. Great. You got maybe 14, 17 endorsements from, I guess, high profile Arizona. Every single one of them white, mostly old white males. But, you know, every single one of them. There's zero diversity to be found anywhere in her website. And it's not something she seems to be talking about or concerned with in any way, shape or form. Now, you, I mean, we talked about racial systemic bias issues, but we really didn't talk about um, whether this is a priority for you when you begin to staff this office and who you're going to, what kind of uh, folks are you going to surround yourself with to carry out your mission? Yeah. So first, uh, with respect to Rachel Mitchell, her attorney leadership team is as white as the faces who have endorsed her. So it has been true in that office that historically people of color have not been promoted, have not had these sorts of opportunities. The leadership in that office needs to be as diverse as the community it serves. And that is a campaign value. That is what my team looks like. We are Maricopa County. We have folks from, I, I, we, we, have, we have so much diversity on our team. Like I struggle to actually articulate it in the time that we have left together. And that's not um that's an intentional choice to be inclusive but to build an environment where that is celebrated and not tokenized and that is something that we need to change in the county attorney's office because this is the third largest office in the country it's simply unacceptable given the racial disparities in policing and prosecution that there are racial disparities in hiring as well nice all right so let's circle the square on abortion because what what um, your opponent's sort of theme seems to be is the typical law and order, which is, you know, we're not going to be like one of these cities like Portland. That, that's complete, you know, hellscape, lawless, you know, crime, blood flow running in the streets. And what she said is um, the reason those cities are as they are are because of prosecutors that they've hired these liberal um, radical, I guess it would be the word they would use for radical prosecutors who who have supposedly just decided that um, we're not going to enforce laws we don't want to enforce. And that's a quote from her from what she said. And and it strikes me that not now, not ever sort of is going to feed into that narrative where this is a law for better or for worse. We had one of these trigger 
laws for abortion. And what you are saying is this is a law in the books and I'm not doing it. And hats off to you, but how are you going to respond to this, you know, law and order mentality in the context of that decision that you want to enforce or not enforce? Sure. So first of all, uh, swearing is allowed on this podcast, right? Absolutely. All right. So I saw a tweet yesterday come out of my opponent's campaign that showed just how full of shit she is when it comes to crime. And the tweet was this, that we have record high violent crime in Maricopa County, and therefore we should reelect her. And I just want to point out to everyone that we now have a prosecutor who's campaigning on the fact that during her tenure, we see a spike in crime. And the way that this sort of law and order narrative plays out is it's, you know, uh, tails I win, heads you lose. We see a spike in crime, reelect me. We see crime go down. I'm doing my job. No, we need to break that narrative. And first of all, with respect to those sorts of uh, statistics about crime rates and its association with prosecutors, that has just been, it's been disproven so many times it's difficult to even count. But I do believe it's really important to articulate, especially on the abortion issue, where our values are, because the county attorney gets to choose which cases to pursue, and in fact has an ethical duty to only pursue those cases that are in the interest of justice. And that encapsulates the idea of what is in the taxpayer's best interest in supporting these cases, whether or not somebody can get a conviction at trial, and just the basic you know, morality of the situation. And about half of the cases that come to our county attorney right now aren't prosecuted because of prosecutorial discretion. There's also crimes that are on the books that our county attorney has not and will never enforce. For example, we still have a misdemeanor law that criminalizes cheating on your spouse. But do we want to send people to jail for six months for adultery? Or do we want to spend our precious public safety money doing uh, working on, on issues and crimes that actually affect us the most? So I thought it was really important when running for this spot to that people know that I'm not going to use our taxpayer dollars to invade your private lives, invade your bedrooms, and enforce these laws that date back to the Confederacy era when it comes to abortion. And if I can just briefly like tell you what they are too. So we have uh, two laws from 1864 that Rachel Mitchell has said that she's going to enforce. One is a mandatory minimum of two years and a max of five for anyone who performs an abortion without any uh, sort of immunity for people who self-perform an abortion. Um, We also have, dating back to 1864, a law that creates a misdemeanor prohibition on even the advertisement of abortion and contraceptives. And And contraceptives? And contraceptives, yep. Wow. Oh, okay. When we're talking about these very old um, Howell Code era laws, that's that's what we're talking before before people like me even had the the right to vote, the ability to vote. Um, We also have a 15 week abortion ban that's going into effect on September 23rd. And we have this law that's been enjoined by the federal court, but who knows for how long that's called fetal personhood that gives a fertilized egg the same rights, privileges, and immunities as you or I, and sets up the idea that an abortion could be something far more major than a two-year sentence, but could potentially be murder under the, the laws of the state or child neglect or abuse, setting people up for the possibility of, of a lifetime in prison or even the death penalty mm. for having an abortion. Mm. And yeah. in in light of all of this chaos, in light of the fact that not a single attorney was willing, who was in, who had the power to do so, was willing to make any sort of statements as to what was and what is not legal, um, because confusion, of course, is the point. Uh, I think it's important to have that bold statement that people can understand. No, this isn't going to be a case by case basis. These are unjust. These are a waste of our resources. No, not now, not ever. Very nice. Very nice. I think that is a perfect place to end. But I will say again, if you are so inclined to donate to Julie Gunnigal's campaign, Gunnigal 2022, Gunnigal2022.com. Is there anything else I want to give you? Well, you had a great last word there, but is there anything else you want to say? I'll give you the last word or anything else we need to know about how we can help or how somebody who's inclined to help can help the campaign or whatever, anything. Yeah. Listen, this race was decided by 1% of the voters last time. 
And out of 2 million people that cast a ballot in Maricopa County, 180,000 people express, expressed no preference in the county attorney race. You want to get involved with the race? This is a race to stand by. This is a race where educating your neighbors can make all of the difference in the world. This isn't a race that can be won and lost by the simple difference of a little bit of fundraising. So if you've got the time, talent, and treasure, I want you to come spend it at gunnagal2022.com. Very nice. And I said I'd give you the last word, but that's exactly the issue. And it's why I do this podcast. I want people to understand how this system works. And of course, they don't think about county attorney because they think, well, that has no effect on my life. I'm never going to I don't even know what they do. But the truth is, it, once it does, it matters. And it matters whether you do or you don't. But you need to pay attention to this race more than I think more than the attorney general. I think this is this is um, pivotal, a pivotal race. So please pay attention and please pay attention in all over the place. And thank you, Julie Gunnigal, for um, that made no sense. What I just said, please pay attention all over the place. But that's OK. It's late in the day. <laughs> all I can say is I'm really deeply grateful that you spent probably more time than you 45 minutes. But I appreciate you. I wish you the best of luck. If your opponent wants to come on and have the same conversation, I welcome her anytime. But in the meantime, Gunnigal22.com. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you. That's it for today. But before we go, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you. To you, the listener, for spending time with us today getting set for sentencing. Whether you're a lawyer, someone who could use the help, or maybe you're just a true crime buff who loves the inside scoop on how this whole thing works. I am so glad you're here, and I hope you keep listening. If you like the podcast, please do me a favor. Spread the word about Set for Sentencing and give us a rating and review on the iTunes podcast platform. It would really help. Last but not least, if you're interested in knowing more about what I do, mitigation videos, case consults, live teaching, on-demand educational content, books, articles, all of it, please visit www.dougpassonlaw.com. I'm Doug Passon. Until next time, hang in there. Wait a minute, that's a stupid way to sign up on a podcast about sentencing. Hang in there. What's the matter with you, man? I guess they call that gallows humor. Sorry. All right. Well, I will see you next time on Set for Sentencing. Bye-bye.